Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Big banks kick off earnings season today. That will test the market resilience for this year. The Magnificent Seven drive a rebound in stocks with Apple unveiling plans for a new in-house AI-powered chip. And Mideast Mid risks demand stoke for gold and silver as oil resumes gains. Well, you just got me this morning. Manis will be on in about an hour with team surveillance. But in the meantime, if you thought that higher rates would kill this equity rally, well, you haven't been paying attention to recent history. It is remarkable the ability for equities to hold up. PPI helps spark a rally for equities, but not when it comes to bonds. Sure, we are a bit softer this morning. S&P down about a tenth. Dow Jones, that's up about a tenth. NASDAQ underperforms, but maybe that's because of the outperformance of the NASDAQ yesterday. We were almost at an all-time high yesterday, 0.17% away from a new record. That was largely helped by Apple. Apple unveiled new chips for their max AI power that got the market excited up some 4% Amazon for its part also hit a new all-time high now it is earnings that we turn our eyes to when it comes to the cross asset story again a cooler PPI wasn't enough to save this bond market it is calmer this morning tenure yields down by nearly five basis points but they've just been charting higher and higher we're still above 4.5% when it comes to the euro we've heard a lot of language we heard this from Lagarde yesterday we are in in Independent from the Fed. We heard it from Stenaris today saying that it is now time to diverge. So if cuts are coming sooner from the ECB than from the Fed, this is the kind of pricing you get 0.5% weaker heading towards uh, parity 1.06 on your euro versus the dollar. Meanwhile, the entirety of the commodity space keeps trending higher. NYMEX crude up 1.1% as Israel prepares for any potential response from Iran or its proxies. At the same time, gold hitting new highs at the same time silver at its highest in 30 years both the geopolitical tensions and banks buying gold now again we look to earnings now the estimates are about 3.8 percent annual growth for the entirety of the s p 500 for the for the first quarter we're also going to get banks we're going to get jp morgan we're going to get city and we're going to get wells fargo so that is what's up joining us now is coco agablua global head of economics cross asset and quant research at societe generale i mean coco it is remarkable to see the damage in the bond market not translate into equities and i know the thesis strong corporate balance sheets mean they can survive higher rates but what does that mean for how much is hinging on this earnings season for these companies to show up and show up with profits? Well, I think this has clearly been one of the, the fascinating uh, dynamic. And for me, it's really boils down to what I call the original sin, which is this massive whatever fiscal, whatever it, it takes response to COVID that government have engaged in in 2021 by literally injecting $25 trillion of liquidity, both monetary and fiscal. Um, and then to your point, co companies have sort of developed a natural immunity against inflation and interest rate because they have refinanced their balance sheet in 2021, locking very low level of interest rates and adding insult to injury. They are able to put excess cash into money markets uh, at 5 percent when they've locked in 3 percent interest rate out of the, for the next five years. So net interest expense is actually going down as interest rates are going up, which is a, a sort of a headache for central banks. And the second key point is pricing power. I call this, we call this greed, greed inflation, which is this ability to raise prices by more than input costs. Now, going forward, I think the market is repricing growth. So we were pricing eight, six to eight uh, cuts this year in January. It went down to three. And after the CPI numbers yesterday and the strong drop data, we are below 2% uh, cut. So it's a no landing, no cuts uh, scenario. And this is positive for equities because it means the higher discount rate through higher bond yield is being offset by higher long-term growth. Uh, and this is where we sort of, we continue to be bullish on U.S. equities uh, and expect another sort of 6 to 8% uh, upside from here. I mean, what you lay out sort of as the original sin, you have this huge amount of fiscal spending, the liquidity there. So companies are immune to inflation. They refinance to lower rates. They have excess cash they're putting in mar money markets. There's greedflation. Koku, that doesn't sound like an environment where inflation is heading back to 2%. Well, this is a very good point because it really boils down to the correlation between inflation and growth. Um, and one of the interesting points to bear in mind is that the second largest economy in the world, China, is facing disinflationary forces or potentially a last decade. And this is why we've seen, in my well, in some analysis, this lack of this sort of deflationary exports. Uh, by China to the rest of the world through the commodity channel. 
But now, with commodity prices uh, going back up, uh, it is clearly um, it clearly means that the path of least resistance is for inflation to be stickier for, uh, for longer. That being said, I think uh, central banks are simply by holding interest rate the way they are today. It's really acting uh, gradually as a restricting force for the economy because we have to bear in mind one very important point, which is the refinancing wall. Yeah. Uh, all that debt that was locking a low level of interest rate is com coming due in 25, 26. So the longer we wait at these levels, um, the tightening effect will show up through, uh, through time. Does that mean then we could possibly not see cuts until after that maturity wall, Koku? Well, I think this is an interesting point because the U.S. has, uh, the, the Fed has the double mandate. So uh, maximum employment and price stability. Um, and whereas the ECB is really around price stability. So it is because of that lag effect. If you wait to see the evidence of inflation at 2% and you start cutting, then it might be too late because you could crash the economy. Um, and this is why uh, we still expect over time some gradual preemptive strikes, so to speak, so to speak, to sort of lessen the impact of interest rates um, as we see uh, confirmation of the, that the trend is in the right direction. But today, with the 0.4% uh, CPI month of month data, it doesn't seem like inflation is cooling. So I think the first scenario is potentially for no cuts. And then, uh, and then uh, if we see, uh, if we still don't see evidence of, of a slowdown in inflation, then the probability of cuts could, of higher rates could come back into the conversation. I mean, but I it's, think just, it's, it's, it's just such a careful gap. balance, right? Because if you still have corporates still strong and you want to do these preemptive cuts, you have to make sure that it's not fueling something that, that you don't want. But Koku, in this environment where it is potentially no cuts, it is higher for longer, it is commodities resurging, this, this feels a lot like 2021. This feels a lot like the post-pandemic playbook. Is that what you're dusting off? In other words, bonds aren't going to help you this time. You get some of your protection from commodities and you want to buy tech and you want to buy stocks more broadly. Yes, absolutely. I think tech uh, is, is essentially going through a sort of new industrial revolution through AI uh, and the massive productivity gain that is uh, to, to what that will occur over time. Um, and therefore, the equity bond correlation is, is actually going the other way around. So the source of safety could potentially be uh, the major source of, of risk. But I think it really boils down to productivity gains as well. So if companies are able to improve that element, it could lessen the uh, inflationary uh, forces and therefore get us to a, a sort of an environment where we don't have a, a spiral uh, of inflation out of control. Right. But it is something that the banks are monitoring uh, on all the sort of data by data, because there's a huge amount of uncertainty uh, in terms of the volatility of the economic data. Yeah, I mean, we got JP Morgan earnings today, and Jamie Dimon in his investor letter said, we found 400 uses for AI. So they're certainly targeting some efficiency there. Now, Coco, we, we have this reappraisal of the Fed. But when it comes to reappraisal of Europe, of the ECB, the same isn't happening because of what we've heard potentially from Lagarde yesterday and Sonaris this morning. So in Lagarde's press conference, she said very clearly we are not Fed dependent. Giannis Sonaris, the chairman of the Bank of Greece, said now it's the time to diverge. You can see clearly the impact of that on euro dollar down about half a percent. We're at 106 this morning. Koku, can the ECB be cutting before the Fed? Is it advisable for them to do so? And what could be the market impact if they do? Well, this is clearly would be uh, the first time that the ECB was essentially cut before the, the Fed. Uh, and I think it's um, it's something that is potentially advisable because the dynamic of, the, of both economies are different um, and the mandates are different. So the ECB has clearly a, a, a priority around price stability. And the other very important point, and I think this is why it's important for the ECB to look at the data carefully, is the sovereign, a potential sovereign debt crisis or let's say debt sustainability. So we have the France uh, credit rating that's uh, potentially going to be downgraded. There's uh, uh, Belgium as well, uh, because of all that debt that was uh, taken around COVID. So I think that um, managing the level of interest rate at the sovereign level is going to be a key in, in that regard. And this is why I think the incentives are, are, are different uh, between the and the consequences will clearly be uh, sort of a weaker euro. Uh, and that could potentially be positive for equities in, in that regard as well. Coco, does the Fed not have that same incentive, given that by all expectations that the spending from the U.S. government is going to continue, whether it's Biden or Trump in the White House? Does the Fed, of course, they're not influenced 
by politics, but but surely that's playing out in their mind if they don't cut the huge fiscal burden that's rising in the United States. Yes, that's clearly the case. But the offsetting element is the nominal GDP growth that's still pretty strong in the U.S. And if you look at uh, in terms of tax receipts, etc., or simply uh, it potentially inflating their way out of the debt problem, I think the U.S. has a, probably a bit more time than than what the eurozone is facing in terms of debt sustainability. Um, and therefore, I think they have uh, the ability to buy themselves more time before having to cut aggressively. But I think at the end of the day, for investors, what's really interesting is that the, the central bank's put is still out there and pretty powerful. So were we to have an endogenous or exogenous shock, we have 500 basis point of cutting capacity and 400 basis point of cutting capacity by the ECB. So, the, so it's, actually, it's essentially as if we're having a call option on, hmm. on, on markets uh, because of the we're no longer in these sort of zero bound uh, issues and that forced central banks to go into QE. Today, we pretty much have a scenario of if the economy is stronger, then that's good for earnings and therefore you keep rates where they are. And then if we have weakness and, and, and a shock, then you would have that put being exercised into stabilizing the economy. So it is pretty interesting uh, sort of context for uh, risk assets. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and really lends itself to more stability. Koku, insightful as always. Really, uh, thank you for coming on this morning. Koku Agablua of SockGen. Okay, let's get to some of the other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. China's March export shrank 7.5% in March from a year earlier. Imports, for their part, fell 1.9%. Both of those falling short of estimates. The data is a new blow to hopes that global demand would help drive growth. Separately, the Wall Street Journal reports that China's push to replace foreign technology is now focused on cutting American chip makers out of the country's telecom system. The UK economy grew for a second month, month in February, suggesting that a recovery from recession is now underway. GDP rose 0.1% from January. That's in line with the gain forecast by economists. January's figure was revised up to show a 0.3% increase. President Biden is moving to block oil and gas development in millions of acres of Alaska's North Slope with an initiative that could be finalized within days. The administration says it needs to balance oil developments with protecting habitat for polar bears, migratory birds and caribou. Companies with leases in the region, including Santos, ConocoPhillips and Armstrong, have objected to the plan. U.S. regulators are scrutinizing Morgan Stanley's efforts to prevent potential money laundering by wealth clients. The Wall Street Journal says the SEC and the Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network have sought information on certain clients outside the U.S. who've raised red flags and on the bank's policies to address them. The Fed was already known to be looking into those money laundering controls last year. Speaking of banks coming up, earnings season kicks off with the banks. They'll be reporting before the bell. We're going to discuss with Walter Todd of Green One Capital, who owns a bank or two. But first, commodities get a boost. Tensions in the Middle East stoke demand. Records on gold. We're going to have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Brent climbing this morning. It's back above $90. Silver, it's at a three-year high. Gold, at a record high. It is a commodity rally that continues as Israel prepares for a possible attack from Iran. Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities, Will Kennedy, joins us now. Will, it is yet another day where energy, the energy complex, the commodity complex, continues to trend higher. At what point is a wider conflict priced in. How much further does this rally potentially have to go? Uh, well, I think that the rally is to do with geopolitical risk, but uh, as I said, it is also uh, that risk comes on top of what is a very fundamentally a strong oil market right now, and the uh, geopolitical risks are just adding juice to it. Clearly, a lot will depend on what any retaliation from Iran looks like, whether that comes from proxies in the region or is a direct strike, how successful that strike is, how much people feel that Iran, Israel will have to retaliate again in turn. So I think depending on what happens from here, clearly there is uh, more upside, but it will be a question of whether that uh, retaliation happens and what form it takes and how successful it is. 
Well, what do you make of the IEA report, the International Energy Agency, this morning? They've cut their demand for oil in 2025, and they see even slower growth in 2025. I mean, I mean that runs counter to what has really been expected, the resiliency of economies in the world, uh, and OPEC itself perhaps doesn't exactly agree with that type of forecast. Yes, there does seem to be uh, divergence, as there has been uh, for several months between what the IEA, which has taken a more cautious view of demand than some other parties, OPEC especially, but also we heard from several large oil traders this week that they see really strong demand. And uh, VTOL, for example, said that growth would uh, this year might be 1.9 million barrels a day compared with the 1.2 that the IEA is uh, now predicting. I would make perhaps a couple of points that 1.2 is still relatively strong by historical standards and it will grow almost virtually the same amount uh, next year. So yes, it is interesting that they've downgraded things a little bit, but I don't think that many traders will see that as an enormous trade change in the narrative at this stage. Well, OPEC itself said yesterday that robust oil demand outlook for the summer warrants careful market monitoring. Is there any sign that the summer, this summer demand will be extraordinary and anything different that OPEC will need to adjust to? Well, uh, the summer is the peak demand season as Americans especially take to the roads uh, for, for holidays. Um, so we're already in uh, April and the market's quite tight. So the fear is that mm. if we get a strong driving season as it can, it can really pressure the supply demand balance in the market and so people will be watching that demand figure very closely the other thing that they will be watching very closely is how OPEC plus decides to respond to the current market when it meets in June well just generally it has been a boom time for commodities in the past couple of weeks gold at an all-time record iron ore best week in two years I mean the the statistics are wrapping up are racking up is it time to start talking about a commodity super cycle again I don't think that super cycle is an especially uh, useful term. Uh, I think uh, cycle will do just fine. I mean, the super cycle relates to the industrialization. Oh, it, sounds of good. it sounds great. <laughs> you know, it's one of those words that journalists are drawn to. Uh, I don't think that you know we're in that situation. But clearly, commodities are having a having a moment. Oil, we've discussed at length. I think copper, people have been bullish about for some time. Um, and it does seem that there are some particular, you know, what we have seen are some supply disruptions against healthy demand, again, driven by the electrification, everything, and a relatively strong uh, global economy, and that is uh, driving prices higher. Gold, of course, is its own thing, but I think what mm. the uh, rally into gold tells you is that people are concerned that uh, inflation may prove sticky, right. uh, especially at, even as uh, the... Uh, central banks cut rates so people are turning to it and it is also a good geopolitical haven so it has its own reasons to be going higher but mm. yes it's true that commodities is having a moment right now are having a moment right now uh, i don't think i'll be pulling out the super cycle okay fair just enough yet. fair enough well i too will start to call it they're having a moment i feel humbled and corrected for my use of jargon will kennedy thank you so much this is bloomberg The head of the $1.6 trillion Norwegian Wealth Fund is skeptical on the inflationary picture coming down and says markets may expect too many rate cuts. The CEO, Nikolai Tengen, sat down exclusively in London with Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua for Leaders with Lacqua Goes Green. Well, it's a bit kind of arrogant to say that the market is wrong, because what is the market? The market is the total IQ of all the people in the world, right? So. Uh, so that's a tough one. I do, I do think that inflation will be tough to get down. There is more nearshoring. Uh, we are seeing some. Uh, we, well, we have recently seen some some more pressure on on raw materials. Uh, wage increases uh, are quite high. So I suspect that we won't see the type of rate cuts that many people expect. And that reprices everything, including your investments. Well, that's what you would have thought, right? But um, markets have been relatively re resilient on the back of uh, changed uh, interest rate expectations. Um, that's been a bit surprising to me. But is that because they still believe it's a cut where actually we could see a hike? Uh, par partly that. 
what, what do you see? I mean, there's this, this U.S. exceptionalism, which is what we're seeing in the U.S. economy, the inflation data, what the Fed does. What have we gotten wrong on the U.S. economy? Well, the U.S. economy is actually pretty good, certainly relative to Europe, right? Um, and we see it as well. When, I'm, when, I have, when I see U.S. CEOs, they are just seeing the, uh, the backdrop for doing business in America is so much better than, uh, than doing business in, in Europe. So uh, um, a lot of things are going right in America. Of Norges Bank coming up. Earnings season kicks off. The big banks report before the bell. We're going to be discussing with Walter Todd of Greenwood Capital. Is it JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon's time to shine once again? Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Here's what you need to know. Big banks kick off earnings season today that will test the market resilience this year. The Max 7 drive a rebound in stocks. Apple unveils plans for a new in-house AI powered chip. And Middle East risks stoke demand for gold and silver as oil resumes gains. The resilience of this equity market has been remarkable. Sure, bonds have struggled. Even with a softer PPI, bond yields still end of the day higher. But stocks, the Nasdaq, almost at a new record, 0.17% away from a new record. Apple, for its part, charges higher thanks to new AI chips. Amazon, it hits a new record, too. This morning, we take a break. We're down a third of 1%, but the Dow Jones still managing to eke out some gains. It's also more stability in bond land. Your 10-year yield this morning is coming down by about five basis points, but again, the trend has been higher. We're still above four and a half percent around the highest level since November. It is a reappraisal of this market of whether or not we will get cuts. Deutsche Bank, the latest bank to issue their outlook, saying we are only going to get one cut. It's bank after bank, sell side strategists after sell side strategists saying we're not getting as many cuts as we assumed. Sonaris and Lagarde, both of them saying we are independent, we are not dependent, we are going our own way, we are diverging from the Fed. The result of that is a euro, which is significantly weaker this morning, weaker by a six uh, tenths of one percent. NYMEX crude off the back of Middle East tensions, higher as is gold at a new record, as is silver at its highest in three years. But what hinges on the market, what the market rally hinges on here is earnings. The market is now predicting fewer interest rate cuts than previously anticipated. And some of Wall Street's biggest banks are expected to rise, revise up their forecast for earnings for, from lending. Morgan Stanley, though, they are feeling the pressure with reports that its wealth unit is under scrutiny from U.S. regulators. Who else would we want to talk to about this besides Bloomberg Shanali Bassick, who joins us here in the studio? Shanali, I mean, the, Surely this is just going to overshadow Morgan Stanley's report season if they have this big regulatory looming over them. Yeah, you have the Wall Street Journal reporting here that significant regulatory bodies, the OCC, the SEC, the Treasury Department, are all looking into what's going on at the wealth manager. And the problem is you don't know the extent of the probe. You don't know what the outcome will be. You don't know if there's reputational damage associated with it. And you also don't know whether there could be fines that would be levied on top of what is going on with the probe. So a lot of questions at one time that lead to both uh, very material potential outcomes. And again, Morgan Stanley has not really outwardly said anything about this yet. So the ultimate outcome is unknown. Remember, Morgan Stanley was down the only one of the big six banks down going into yesterday before the probe was reported on. And right. so still questions about Morgan Stanley under new leadership and what it looks like going forward. A lot to prove over at the bank. And this just one thing on top of that. Meanwhile, we're going to get J.P. Morgan City, Wells Fargo today. It is it is interesting because we just came out of this environment where all these big banks said, hey, cuts are coming. The interest rate environment is going to be different. So we're our forecast for net interest income is going to be lower because of that. So is this going to be the bright spot? Because obviously big cuts to come. That is not what's expected anymore. What's interesting here, and Morgan Stanley's bank analysts point this out, is every bank has a different sensitivity to interest rates. Mm -hmm. And they point out, for example, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America in particular, they actually are the most to gain here if you see less rate cuts. So, for example, one full percentage point would be 
$3 billion, give or take, for Bank of America net interest income above or below what they're already guiding towards. Mm. So the expectation here is that J.P. Morgan is the biggest of the banks that would be expected to increase their net interest income guidance. But as we know, they have moved that bar higher all throughout last yeah. year, and they have that extra headwind of investment banking coming back. We also heard from J uh, Jamie Dimon in his investor letter. We found 400 use cases for AI, and we're already investing heavily into it. So is this reporting season for, J for J.P. Morgan one of more costs because of that investment or more efficiency because of that investment? Well, you have to remember that with inflation still running hot, beyond that investment, the costs tied to these banks are already under question. Mm. Now, one thing that's interesting about J.P. Morgan is J.P. Morgan, among many other banks, they've been hoarding a lot of capital here. You see their CT1 ratio is being very, very healthy. And so you already turn to this place where you can see them inking serious profits, the return on tangible equity being very significant, according to Wall Street estimates. Estimates. And so all of a sudden, we're getting into the second quarter, and your conversation around capital return starts once again. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're not that far away, Danny, from those stress tests this summer. Right. And so the question is, how much is that investment? And you worry less about J.P. Morgan, given it's the most profitable of the big banks anyways, but how that inflationary pressure is going to impact the bottom line at a lot of these big banks. Now, we're also going to get City today. Uh, presumably, we'll hear more from Jane Frazier in terms of what, what her progress is in turning things around in restructuring. It's also the first earnings since she completed a whole lot of job cuts. What's at stake? So to the point you're making here, this is another place where the costs really matter mm. because Citigroup's return on equity has been suppressed relative to the likes of some of their big commercial peers, particularly when it comes to investment banking. So progress on that turnaround, getting a handle on profitability over the course of the year, and then also something very interesting about Citigroup, in the wake of a lot of those job cuts, there's also been a lot of management change, yeah. particularly, Danny, in those core Wall Street businesses, trading, investment banking, markets are still volatile and as you've been saying investment banking coming back so what kind of progress is city making in those core businesses yeah hopefully they've hired enough deal makers to capitalize on that Shanali thank you so much I know you got a busy day ahead of you we'll let you go go get your coffee Shanali Basic there let's now bring in Walter Todd president and CIO of Greenwood Capital which holds positions in JP Morgan Bank of America Wells Fargo and Morgan Stanley Walter great to see you this morning you've got a busy morning ahead of you as well Look, if the story, as Shanali was saying, is that those who benefit from higher rates are going to have an even better quarter, does this just mean J.P. Morgan still is the winner, that there's nowhere else to look in this banking market? Yeah, well, good, good morning, Danny. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, so J.P. Morgan, you know, as we've talked about in past quarters, uh, you know, has been the winner, will continue to be a, a significant winner in this market. They are a net deposit gainer in this environment. They are, their cost of deposits is much lower uh, than other banks. So yeah, I, I expect them to be the best of the best in the reporting this season. But as was alluded to in, in the, the run up here to this segment, um, there are other, you know, other banks like Bank of America will also benefit tremendously. Hmm. I mean, recall that when banks were reporting this time in January, you know, JP Morgan said on their call, we're baking in six cuts and here we are below two. Um, so uh, quite a different backdrop for banks, but you see the in the action of the banks this week, the challenge of the kind of the push and take of higher rates, because it doesn't impact the, the value of their securities portfolios as rates move higher. Well, I mean, Diamond himself said in his investor later, a letter that rates could hit 8% or more with inflation. He also ca ca uh, cast doubt on the soft landing. He didn't agree with the current estimate of 70 or 80%. To be honest, those are two very separate things because if you get higher inflation, rates go to 8%. If you don't get a soft landing, presumably you are cutting more. But if you translate that into what the expectation is for JP Morgan as a whole, I know they often don't exactly line up, but do you think we'll still see hesitation from banks in issuing whole wholesale upgrades of their forecasts. Yeah, certainly on the first quarter calls, they, they all had kind of expected a mild recession in the second half of this year. I think that you know definitely gets pushed out. You know, Jamie's been pretty ahead of the game in terms of calling for higher rates. Recall back in late 22, early 23, he was calling for you know five to six percent, which we kind of got there on mm -hmm. the five percent on the 10 years. So. I hope he's not right about 8% because I think that's a very bad scenario for cap for financial markets uh, if that happens. But 
Um, I do think they're going to have to you know, revise up their estimates for growth because that's just the reality of where we are yeah. right now. That is the worrying thing. He was right last time. And if he's saying 8%, it's a it's a scary world, Walter. And, and look, while, yes. while higher rates are, are good for the likes, I, you know, it's complicated, but higher rates generally benefit the likes of Bank of America, J.P. Morgan. Generally, they're not such a great thing for the regional banks. I know you have a few in your portfolio, PNC, which I know you call a super regional. You own First Horizon, too. What does the reporting season look like for this quarter if regional banks are going to have to get on the call with their investors, with analysts, and say, look, we, we don't have the benefit of hoping that lower rates would give us some relief? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. You really see this in the performance year to date, right? The BKX up about 5% through yesterday. The KRE, which is the regional bank index, down about 10%. So you're kind of seeing that manifested in performance because they don't have the capital markets to offset, you know, some of the challenges around uh, deposit growth and deposit costs. Um, I think there's, first of all, these stocks generally are, are much cheaper than their, their bigger peers, uh, with the exception of Citigroup, which is going through a turnaround. Um, so I think there's going to be more consolidation in, in the banking industry. So that's one play hmm. potentially. First Horizon was kind of at the altar with uh, TD Bank, and that didn't happen. But great footprint uh, here in the southeast. You know, PNC, I think, is big enough and getting bigger that they're going to kind of fall, you know, lean more towards these bigger banks in terms of the, the puts and takes on interest rates. But, yeah, make no mistake, it's going to be a continued challenge for regional banks, particularly on the credit side and, again, the cost of deposits. City, as you mentioned, is, is, is hasn't experienced the same amount of rally because of the turnaround. You don't own City, but we're going to hear more details from Jane Frazier on the progress of that turnaround, of that restructuring. Is there anything that she could say, Walter, to tempt you to dip your toe in? Well, it, you know, City's tempting just simply on the valuation, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's trading at 0.6 times book. So even though it's actually had a pretty good year, year to date on, on this turnaround and cost cuts, um, it's still cheap. So that, that in and of itself is kind of tempting uh, to stick your stick your toe in um, but and and the, and the dynamic of um, you know again the cost cuts and it's just uh, the totally different drivers for Citigroup so it's a it's a stock that we watch um, you know we've owned it in the past at points in time so we could own it again um, I think Jane's doing you know a really good job in terms of what she's trying to do there and Walter when it comes to this broader market I know you said last week when it came to things like payrolls I, I love what you say it's an example of the idea that if you've gotten the data ahead of time you would have gotten the market response wrong. What about the CPI data and the rally that has held up, the, uh, the holding up of big cap tech, of NVIDIA, of the MAG7? Yeah. Has that surprised you too in the face of hotter inflation data? Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, if you look, it was just a battle on the S&P on, on Wednesday at 5150, which was the lows from last uh, Thursday after that sell-off. And so this market just does not want to not want to give up right now. Um, I thought we would see, you know, some 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 more downside pressure off of that, maybe break through the 50 day on the downside. But right now, there's just you know money coming in at these levels. So until we see a you know, definitive breakdown um, and, and give back maybe a traditional kind of 10 to 11 percent type correction, which you get typically every year. Um, People want to come in and put money in this market. So it is uh, a little bit confounding, but, it, it, you know, the trend is what the trend is. Is, is it a trend that, that almost mimics 2021, Walter? Because clearly bonds are not giving you that much protection. But when it comes to the equity market, it's things like tech and it's things like energy as the commodity complex moves higher. Is that the playbook? Are, are we just dusting off what we had three years ago, more or less? Yeah, we certainly were, obviously, in 2023, right? That, that was the playbook. And then early this year, that was the playbook. But, you know, encouragingly, in March, we started to see some, you know, balancing out. We started to see other areas really start to participate, materials, energy, uh, industrials. But over the past, say, five days, as the market's kind of churned here, it's been a flip back to the, really, I would say, the 2023 playbook. That is the market cap-weighted S&P dramatically outperforming uh, the equal-weight S&P. So, that seems to be kind of the go-to in times of, of turmoil. Uh, we'll, we'll see if these maybe these bank earnings are, are good enough to kind of you know, reverse that a little bit. We'll, we'll see. That's a great note to leave it on. We will see. Uh, I look forward to your note in my inbox, Walter, of what you think of uh, what Jamie Diamond has to say. Walter Todd of Greenwood Capital, thanks so much for getting up early for us. Okay, coming up, Apple plans to revamp its entire Mac lineup with a focus on AI. We're going to have more on that Bloomberg scoop coming up next.
It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Apple is looking to revamp its entire Mac line now with AI focused chips. The company is seeking to boost its comp computer sales after Mac sales plunged 27% last year. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. Oliver, the market got excited about this. Apple was up some 4%. So, why all the hype? What do we know about the new chips? Yeah, exactly. So they want to bring in these new chips across their entire MacBook line. So that'll come in about later next year and into next uh, uh, later this year and into next year. And they're talking about the M4 chip here, which has got a lot more computational power. And really the focus here is to try to capitalize on AI, bringing AI across the Apple ecosystem, which is a space where really a lot of people in the tech world see as Apple sort of falling behind Google, Microsoft, obviously Nvidia. Those three names have done, you know, very well this year so far. The stock on Apple, though, you know, has been down. So really trying to regain momentum on the AI. And they're really hoping that these new chips, because, you know, the MacBooks themselves aren't a huge seller for, for Apple. But really, it's like if this technology can come in across the Apple ecosystem, that will make a major difference. And what we need to look forward to is June 10th, which is the annual World Developers Congress in Apple, where everybody from investors to the consumers are looking for that AI strategy, what they're expected to deliver there in that four-day meeting. Well, well that's, that's the thing, Oliver, in terms of the MacBook. It's not the biggest of contributors. It's it's their flagship, it's their iPhone, and their sales have been lagging. So with Apple down 10% year to date, does something like this possess the ability to turn things around? Yeah, so as you say, I mean, revenue for MacBooks is about 8%. You know, as you were mentioning uh, there in the intro that, you know, the uh, the sales there lost about 30% last year. So that could, you know, you could boost a little bit of revenue there. But as you focus on it, as everyone focuses on, it's the iPhone, more than half of revenue. And when you see the headlines like we saw out of China early in the year with sales down there, 25%, you sort of sort of a tech nationalism you have in China and the economy not really recovering, that is a major concern. And when, when you look at the two other major markets for Apple, then that leaves Europe and the United States. And in both of those markets, Danny, as we've been covering, there are huge antitrust investigations that are really plaguing them. So as we're looking forward, investors looking forward, and what are the catalysts here? Really, maybe this sort of move into AI, if they can really get some major wins here, will make a difference because they are really going to struggle on that antitrust front, both in Europe and the United States. Speaking of AI, Kathy Wood has managed to get a stake in open AI. This, this is really the holy grail of investing in AI. Many folks probably want a piece. It's not easy to get, but Kathy Woods has managed to. How did this all go down? Yeah, that's right. So this is a venture capital sort of fund that Kathy Wood is involved in. So let's not oversell this either. This is a relatively <laughs> small fund compared to the other parts of, uh, of her empire, right? It's about $55 million. But she did get a piece of open uh, open AI into the fund, in the venture fund. It'll constitute about 4% of uh, the portfolio there. It's invested in other companies like SpaceX, some private companies and public companies as well. But again, you compare that to something like Microsoft that's dumped, you know, $13 billion into open AI with a valuation of, you know, close to 80 Six billion. The last time there were some sh shares sold um, by employees. Really, they want to get more and more exposure to you know that all the chat GPT, but also the text to video. They also like a bold uh, prediction. So let me, if I may, just uh, read something to you from the Arc chief futurist. Maybe that's a good job for you, Danny <laughs> Brett Winton. We think that there is a 16 trillion dollar possibility in prospective market cap that will be commanded by foundation model type companies by 2030. So 16 trillion dollars. That is part of the market that they want a piece of. See, I don't think I could be a chief futurist because then I think I would realize that uh, at some point AI is going to replace me and I think that, that that would be very depressing. So I don't think that's a job I want. Um, elsewhere, I mean, there is more competition stacking up for open AI, Oliver. You have all of these startups, you have all these ventures, and some of them have huge names attached to them, Elon Musk being one of them. And, and he's currently looking to raise money for that venture. Absolutely. So we know from a pitch deck that's about 20 pages that's circulating around Silicon Valley the last couple of days, um, investors and VCs, he wants to raise about three to four billion dollars that would give XAI, you know, we see sort of in the branding family of the X, um, uh, a, a market value of potentially 18 billion dollars. I mean, this is still sort of early stages, so, you know, that figure may settle around. But really, they're trying to tout his record at Tesla, his, his record at SpaceX. Obviously, he was also one of the founding members of OpenAI, and that split up obviously, for, I guess we can call creative differences, philosophical differences. But what I thought was interesting from one of the selling points that they're highlighting there is that they're going to use all of the data from Twitter, aka X, to train all of these large language models that, that you know, Elon Musk has got for the XAI, which is sort of an interesting thing because so much has been made about the massive value destruction, how much potentially he overpaid. Maybe for Elon Musk, this is another way to monetize the X asset and all of its data.
Man, I, I hope they're using a, a long timeline for that, for the, for the X data, because I feel <laughs> X as of late has had some scary posts on it. And uh, Lord save us if that's, if that's we'll what he's get AI the Danny Burger from 2009. <laughs> no, that's a bad idea, too. Let's not do that one either. <laughs> Oliver, thank you so much. Oliver Crook there. Okay, a quick check on commodities. Because it has been a sizable rally that we've seen. Oil, you can pin that down to geopolitical tensions. Israel is... Uh, preparing itself for a response from Iran from their uh, potential attacks in Syria. Meanwhile, gold is at an all-time high. A couple of factors between here. It is also the geopolitical tensions, but it's also the fact that its central banks have been in mass buying gold. Silver, that is at a three-year high, a very similar dynamic. Copper, that is at a June 2022 high. There's mine supply shock, supply disruption. There is a greater than expected global demand. Iron ore, it's seeing its best week in two years. Speculation that China's economy is on the mend. You get the flavor here. And it is one which the commodity sector is one that will give you protection when bonds are not. It is also a risk of higher inflation and a political risk as Americans in just a few months head to the polls. Now, your quick check on bonds, 10-year yields, they are lower. We're getting a reprieve this morning after even softer PPI did nothing to help settle this bond market. We saw bonds that went to their highest levels since November. We also saw real yields tick up to their highest levels since November. You see 10-year yields in Germany, not as dramatic. Uh, Lagarde did emphasize that, look, we are dependent from the Fed. We are not dependent on the Fed. And because of that, we can cut sooner. Stenara said the same thing. It's the reason that the euro is weakening, weakening significantly this morning. Okay, coming up, we're going to take a look at some of the market moving events that you need to watch throughout the day. That includes you, Mitch, consumer sentiment. Have inflation expectations also held steady for the consumer? Or are they backing off? That's next here on Bloomberg Reef. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day on this Friday. Earnings season has arrived. The big banks, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo, are due to report results before the bed. Bell, rather. The BOE issues a report on forecasting monetary policy by former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke at 7 a.m. Eastern. And University of Michigan consumer sentiment numbers, those come out at 10 a.m. Eastern. Meanwhile, here's what's moving in the pre-market session. Life insurance company Global Life, they dropped by a record. There's a short seller report that the company refuted. It closed at its lowest level in eight years, so it's rebounding from that up nearly 10%. Lucid, meanwhile, also yesterday was at new lows for slash prices on its EV pickup truck. That also rebounds this morning. Meanwhile, Intel shares fall. The Wall Street Journal reported that China has asked its telecom carriers to start replacing foreign chips in their core networks by 2027. Well, new note from Michael Hartnett at Bank of America just dropped saying it's ABB, anything but bonds, that bulls are inciting greed for inflation hedges and monopolistic cash flows. Very no landing, very 1999. Okay, that's it for brief. Surveillance takes it from here.